Marxists are scientists, and we got to always be studying world movements, new developments, what the class struggle on the other side of the world is teaching here, and they're also looking to what demands we make here. I want to talk about a virus, and it's new, and it's what's unknown is how contagious it is. It's a variation of the common cold. That's not, wouldn't seem like a big deal. It attacks a respiratory system, leads to high fevers. But what's the mortality rate? This is a very new thing, uh, really just a little bit more than a month old. And yet this virus kind of confirms how everything, even a virus, not that the virus knows it, but everything on this planet today is political and is all part of the class struggle. And it is a global class struggle. And so that's what we want to really pull out. Because this is a virus that started in China. Now, is China responsible for a virus? Let's talk about what some viruses have done. The common flu causes up to 5 million cases of severe illness worldwide and kills up to 600, no, 605,000 people, 50,000 people every year, according to the World Health Organization. It sometimes helps to just put numbers in perspective, even though we don't know where this, and, and China has every right to be concerned, right? But 650 thousand people every year die just from the common flu. In 1918, the Spanish flu virus caused between 40 to 50 million deaths. Between 2014 and 16, the Ebola virus started in West Africa, uh, caused 11,325 deaths. From 2009 to 2010, the swine flu, or the H1N1 virus, started in the U.S., caused 284,500 deaths globally. 2017 through 18, flu, the H3N2 virus, caused 80,000 deaths in the United States. And 2020 coronavirus started in Wuhan, China, caused 500 deaths there in China. A lot more may be on the way, but this is what China's worried about. They're worried about some of the past pandemics. They're worried about how quickly things can escalate. They're worried about numbers like the swine flu, which started in the U.S., and nothing was done nothing was done. They didn't even gather the figures for another couple of years and it swept around the globe. Or the flu just the year before, 2017, 2018, 80,000 deaths in the U.S. alone. And then there's all the global figures that they haven't finished gathering yet. So, do they have a right to be concerned? Of course. Two days later, the Chinese Center for Disease Control had sequenced the entire genome of the virus, a rapidly achieved feat that it will help scientists around the world more fully understand it. For comparison, during the 2014 outbreak of Ebola in West Africa, it took scientists two months to completely sequence that virus's genome. Data from Chinese scientists have been published in international medical journals, such as the New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet, as well as in domestic journals, China Science Life Sciences. China, the response to the outbreak has been swift and ma massive in cooperation with WHO's and the international scientific community it is taking the outbreak very seriously. Party committees and governments at all levels must take novel coronavirus outbreak prevention and control as the top priority of their work, said President Xi Jinping at a January 25th meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. 
which set up a high-level task force to combat the virus. Led by Premier Lee Kate Young, the task force arrived in Wuhan on January 26th to coordinate efforts to contain the outbreak. As of January 27th, the Ministry of Finance has allocated $8.74 billion to combat the virus. Now, that's an important summary that Josh, in both describing <coughs> what the virus is, in a very rational way, not in a scary way, and also what measures China was taking. But it gets back to, you know, there are like two stories going on in the world, right? And that's what we want to talk about next. When I say this is really part of the class struggle today, how to even see or understand this virus, how to handle a disease, what is the responsibility of the government, and how people can be mobilized or not. Uh, two different news sources, two different kinds of news stories. CNN, Fox, Google News, New York Times, Washington Post, and NBC News. It's the U.S., right? Chinese news sources in English. Uh, Global Times, People's Daily, uh, Xinhua Net, and CCTV English uh, YouTube. Now I raise this because sometimes, you know, we get asked, where do you get your information? Like there's some secret font. But it's actually very available. It's just coming from China itself and not coming through the filter of the U.S. corporate news, which has totally flipped this story. And, and that's, that's really the important message here. But it's also so that everyone here has, if they want to do your own online checking, what are some real sources of news from China? Uh, and, they, and it's interesting to follow what's in the Global Times or, or if you're checking out on YouTube, CCTV. They have constant hundreds of small news articles, one and two minute pieces that are describing a great deal. So let's talk about what the media focus on China is. Before I put this up, maybe some, some folks want to describe a little bit what you've seen here. What you've seen in the U.S. media. You wanted me to talk about basically what is my impression from what I've seen in the media, right? Okay, um, what rings true to me is they talk about a lot of deaths. And I think it's, um, I don't know if it sounds silly to say it, but it just sounds like a bunch of scare tactics to me. Um, and I mean, I've heard things like all of, you know, most of China, everybody, most of China is infected, and then they have all of these uh, quarantines and um, travel bans and things like that. So that's basically what I hear. Uh, yesterday, uh, I saw an article where um, a worker was home and he received a phone call to not to come to work, and he was wondering why he was being terminated. And he was given no reason, but when he contacted his coworkers, he found out that uh, he was fired for being Chinese. And they explained that they said that customers were uncomfortable with his presence. You know, same old racist shit. There was a, a lot of um, uh, Twitter traffic about this um, medical worker in China who died, and, and they said that he uh, had tried to alert China, but the officials of what was going on, and they were ignoring him. <laughs> and he 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 got um, the virus and died apparently today or yesterday. Anyway, so what struck me is that like two days later they sequenced the genome and they built all these hospitals right away and you know, a, amazing reaction and it's just like this totally denying reality of what's, what's going on. Also out of this article, the thing that struck me was that when they did the task force, um, the bourgeois media here said, oh, they you know, can't be that serious because President 
Um, Jinping is not the head of the task force. He's probably worried that it's not going to be able to accomplish anything, so he didn't want to be associated with it. But instead, it's the premier. And they go there. They're actually on site. You know, they leave those details out. They leave out the details about the amount of money cap, um, that is being allocated to be able to do this. And they definitely downplay the building of the hospitals. But the other big thing out of all this and all the media here is the racism. And the number, the increase of attacks on individuals as well as um, organizations and China itself. The coronavirus uh, reawakens old racist tropes against Chinese people. And that's the Washington Post from February 5th. Uh, my eyes are still pretty good. <clears throat> Racism shows ugly side as China fights coronavirus. Uh, I can't read that headline. Uh, Global, Global Times, uh, China, and there's no date, it's just uh, the, um, the third one is China criticizes unfriendly US comments and the fight against novel coronavirus um, epidemic. That's uh, English uh, China, mili it's a military website. Um, uh, February 1st, 2020. U.S. media focus on China. Uh, authoritarian state. Slow response. It's taken three weeks. Confusing, inept, ineffective. Ridicule of measures to boost morale and public education. Uh, predictions of shortages, price spirals, mass chaos, long lines. Uh, individual rights versus collective health. Detention without charges. That's what the U.S. media focuses on. China. Any of the stories, and, and the last few days, I think there's like five pages a day in the New York Times on the coronavirus. It's, it's sort of incredible. Uh, and it's true in all the media. If you're just spiraling through a Google News feed, you'll see article after article. And they're each taking a different angle. But it's really saying you know, that this is an authoritarian state, they've locked people down and they're going to be stuck without food and, and there's going to be mass chaos. I mean, this is really the, the prediction. And then they ridicule, actually, the thousands of health workers going to Wuhan, saying, oh, isn't this ridiculous why they're carrying red banners and, you know, they're, they're confident and, and so on. So, uh, it... it Reading the news is really interesting if you're reading the U.S. news because then again, if you compare it to what they're reporting in China, they're both describing what they're doing, they're describing assistance that's coming, and how they're going to take care of it. So let's, let's go over some of the things that they're covering. Emergency health measures build two hospitals in 10 days, 1,000 beds, 1,600 beds, latest equipment. The most advanced measures treat respiratory illnesses. Text, test kits distributed nationally. Mass distribution of masks and gloves. Massive fresh food deliveries to Wuhan enforce stable prices, freeze all payment obligations on loans, credit cards, and rent, <coughs> mass education on health measures, thousands of doctors and medical teams sent to Wuhan, national focus on research into uh, cures and prevention. Full assistance and solidarity, solidarity affirms China's battle against the coronavirus by Hu Yue, uh, published on 2020, February 5th. Many foreigners have chosen to stay in China to join the battle against the novel coronavirus ah. epidemic. Governments and leaders of foreign countries are also aiding China, showing firm friendship. Epidemic prevention and control supplies donated by 21 countries have arrived in China so far. This is just one, um, I, I couldn't post the whole article here, but this is one article describing uh, people actually traveling to China, volunteering en masse, coming from other parts of China, and from other countries around the world uh, in a real mass display of solidarity. 
and, and to raise morale. And so that is some of the other coverage. I, I couldn't find any mention of this anywhere in the U.S. press. And I went looking, I want to say. I, there are certain news stories I wanted to see. Gee, if they're highlighting this in China, did it get into any of the U.S. press? No. Now, the one thing that has been in the U.S. press a great deal is the quarantine. The quarantine. So let's discuss what the quarantine is and what it means. Because, you know, there's always the image from quarantines in the Middle Ages and, and what was called the, the, the Black Death, you know, from the, and, and it was unknown and it was terrifying to people. And so the idea of being stuck where there is disease is very scary, right? Uh, but how is it, this, what's happening in China in this area of Wuhan? Partial quarantine, 35 million people, more than 10 largest U.S. cities. Isolate those sick. Restrict public gatherings to lessen contagion. Close theaters, sports centers, shopping malls, schools, and non-urgent workplaces, including offices and factories. Restrict travel, trains, public trans transport, air travel, shut down. Cancel Chinese New Year celebrations. Testing and monitoring in all public places. Open hospitals, health centers, food shops, free taxis for essential trips. So, so let's really, and, and I'm sure folks here have seen some things both in the U.S. press, let's describe, discuss sort of what you've seen that's really hostile, and also what you've seen, is this good? Is this an infringement on personal rights or not? Is this a way of combating disease? I wanted to comment that um, the, the way they're phrasing this as, as a really huge negative, it bothered me because it's um, the hypocritical nature, because just this morning I saw that in Japan, the authorities there quarantined an entire cruise ship with 3,700 people. Two. And two, two cruise, cruise ships? ships? Yeah. Okay, so two cruise ships, and as the you know, on those ships, you're stuck in in that room that's like the size of a closet, mm -hmm. the way they have it on you know on a boat. That I think would make me lose all. Like I would freak out being in that kind of a. But anyway, it's it's hard, and it's like, but they just report it as, oh, wow, you know, vacation from hell. But then when it happens in China, it's like this authoritarian government is is trapping people, and it, it just, there's no sense of um, proportion. I don't know. So that, it's irritating me. What about what China is doing that shows how superior planning, a uh, system that, that's built on planning uh, uh, um, for the needs of people? Is, is just a, a more effective in the superior system to tell you know. Um, one of the shortages that, that occurred in, in China during this epidemic was the, the masks that people have to wear to, still no cloth masks, and they had a shortage. So they built a factory in two days. <laughs> a ma uh, factory just to, make, just to make surgical masks. That's it. How about closing theaters, sports centers, shopping malls, <laughs> schools? All workplaces that aren't to do with urgent care. What do we think of that? That's where it spread. That's where it spreads. That's where it spreads. Now, let's look back at this point. Freeze all payment obligations. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Do you think capitalists here would allow that to happen? Now, there are capitalists in China. We should know that. And they can be powerful. But the state and the Communist Party is frankly more powerful. And in a crisis, they're going to say, well, we're freezing the rent, the credit cards, everything. Now, now here, if you get the flu, what do they tell you to do? Go to work. I can stay home. <laughs> really, they do tell you to go to work. And, and the, even all the ads are take Theraflu, and they show 
a teacher sneezing and she takes this liquid and, and she goes right back to teaching a room full of kids. I mean, we've, we've all seen the ads and messages, if you're sick, go to work. And no one would think that their rent could be frozen. How many landlords would be objecting to that? What if every landlord, your rent is frozen for the next month? Would that be allowed? And so there's a reason why these emergency health things aren't covered at all. They simply say people are locked in their apartments. And so anyone in the capitalist world thinks, oh my God, what happened to my job? How am I going to pay my bills? This is Now, I, I think anyone who's locked in their apartment is probably bored to death. Everyone wants to get out, right? <laughs> it's not a great measure. It's not a great measure. But if you have an unknown disease that's spreading very fast, and you're trying to get a hold of it, and they're trying to find immediate treatments and what treatments work the best, right? So they are taking a lot of emergency measures. There may be things that we don't know about this virus that is causing this level of concern as to how contagious it is, what the levels of mortality are, and so on. Uh, but it is it goes back to these earlier figures that China very well knows that diseases spread fast in a global world. Very, very fast. And if you don't take action very quickly, it will spread very fast. And we could look at the lesson of swine flu in the U.S. where no measures were taken. Or we could look at the measure of a flu just last year. It, it happened to be, they said, the most serious flu season in about 40 years. So, so it's not that every year there's 60 to 80,000 deaths. It's usually, it's usually about 20 to 30,000 people in the U.S. that die every year from flu. That's pretty high, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's actually what was particularly dangerous about the swine flu was that hit young people. Almost no one over 60 got it because it seemed it was a mutation of an earlier people had an or old, older people had a natural immunity. So so flus hit different generations. The one in China they feel hits older folks more than younger men more than women, you know, they're, they're studying all these things. It has a lot to do. And, and science can answer things. It can either spread fear, or if you, you get a lock on it very quickly, you have answers that can lead to the best treatment. Now, I wanted to go on a few other things. Um, I want to talk about the HIV AIDS crisis in the US because we can't say well China did that and we're helpless here. You know, I think we have to think even right here if a flu, a pandemic, anything like that hits, what are the kind of tactics, what are the thoughts, what are the demands that we should raise? So that's that's an important part of it. But just before I go into that, just uh, if a few people could describe what brakes does capitalism put on emergency health measures? Well, the health system doesn't want to waste money as they would put it on people who are poor and out from oppressed communities. And those are the ones who are the first in this country to lose out or lose their lives or be ill much longer. In addition, their health issues are more, they're more compromised from health diseases because of lack of food and housing and health care and all the necessities you need that you don't get automatically under capitalism. And that's a real factor here. Uh, I think the way that the U.S. is playing it against China is deliberately to show this is a stupid, crazy country and they have no right to do these things. We wouldn't do that here. And basically, they wouldn't do it where they should do it, 
when there's an epidemic of disease. And the flu has wiped out millions of lives over the decades of flu epidemics that have taken place. So what China has done is very remarkable. They've set up a very difficult situation for people that may not be able to move out of their own house or out of their own community because of a, the epidemic that is happening. But they're doing things to try to stop it from spreading to a much larger number of the population. And that's what the US wouldn't give two hoots about, especially of poor people and people of color in this country. Capitalism, since it is a profit-based system, in a crisis like this, it would just make this available to the rich instead of the poor people. In this country, even I mean, for workers, you have to earn sick time by working. And, uh, <laughs> and, and when you have used up what you have earned, you, you have no more. So workers will go to work sick. Uh, even in a contract with a union like I have, um, when you run out of sick time, you can probably take some more time, but that's your vacation time. And so, screw that vacation you're going to take this summer. And when you run out of those, your job is still in threat, still threatened, because um, you're not, you know, you're less productive according to the boss. Of course, you're not because you're sick. Another thing that happens, I think, under capitalism, certainly in relation to the HIV virus, is um, that in, under capitalism, the people who get sick are stigmatized and groups are stigmatized without any rational reason for it. So, for instance, all gay people were stigmatized during the HIV e epidemic. Haitians were stigmatized under the HIV e epidemic. There was no reason or rationale for it, but they just picked those people. Now, Chinese people are being um, stigmatized. And it makes no sense, but what it does is it stops people from really looking rationally at what the problems are. In 2012, Workers' World Party's People with Disability Caucus held a forum on the anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act, and one of the speakers gave a, spe a talk comparing the response in, of the United States to Hurricane Katrina, Katrina the racist response, to the way Socialist Cuba uh, mm -hmm. rescues and responds and uh, rescues the people in greatest need, people with disabilities and seniors first, uh, and is organized to do that. Um, this week, uh, through my union, I went to a meeting of the New York chapter of the Hearing Loss, Associate, uh, Hearing Loss Association of America, and they had two people from the New York City Agency for Emergency Preparedness, and they were explaining how the city supposedly was trying to provide emergency help in disasters, particularly for people with, people with hearing disabilities. One person asked a question, well, how come people have to fill out this form? Uh, I don't need window guards, or some people are familiar with it, you know, uh, for, as the children don't fall out a window, but there is no form to register people with mobility disabilities that can't get out if there's a power failure, an electrical failure, and they didn't have an answer for that. And um, also, um, they said that um, they still have not changed the 911 emergency system where a deaf person can text. They're supposed to do it in the summer. That's been delayed. They didn't explain why it was delayed. That, that's, how, that, that's where capitalism um, puts profits before people. Thank you. I want to describe where I'm going with this because I think where this virus is going is either this one or another one will come to the U.S., right? Viruses and flus come every single year. And we need to think, as a people's movement, what are the demands that should be raised? What are the demands that people can be mobilized around right here? We can't say, oh, we don't have socialism here. There's nothing we can do. So it's an important question for us to look at, both what China is doing, but I want to look back at the, the lessons learned from the HIV-AIDS crisis, because that was a decade of some of the most incredible struggle. Now. HIV-AIDS, it really began in 1981, 
And by 1983, it was actually identified as the HIV virus. It was a very slow-moving virus that attacked the immune system gradually. It's not like a respiratory virus, so, so we're not making any comparison there. But we're talking about really the impact that it had. It was first recognized by the Center for Disease Control, as I say, in 1981, and, and its cause, the HIV infection, was identified about the same time. But it became not just an illness, it became a source of enormous discrimination, absolutely re reactionary, racist discrimination against LGBTQ people and against Haitians. There was actually a ban, a bar, on any Haitian people coming to the U.S. during this time. There were all kinds of misconceptions about how it was spread, how contagious it was. People were denied treatment, even in hospitals. Now, and I'm, I'm sure there are folks here that have a lot more uh, experiences. I, I just want to touch on this, and then we're going to pass the mic around again. But there was a coalition called the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, and ACT UP, it was called, ACT UP. It was an international, you can still look it up today, grassroots political campaign. And they said they were going to focus on political action. And also gathering information, medical research, treatment, advocacy, working to change legislation, and working on changes in public places. They began, though, with a mass action of mass civil disobedience in front of the U.S. Supreme Court at the time of the, the it was the second national march on Washington for LGBTQ rights. That didn't happen until 1987. So here's, here's a disease that for six years had a hold and was covered daily in the press and creating a hysteria <coughs> And whole families would be blocked and excluded, and, and people couldn't get treatment. Now, it went from that action, hundreds of ACT UP members took over Wall Street uh, and, and to demand greater access to experimental AIDS drugs, and also demanding a coordinated national policy. I mean, when you, when you look back and see how many years it took just to say, let's have a national policy on this. And of course, by then it was spreading worldwide. There was a, another action that the, they shut down, the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, that was in September of 1989. They held a uh, big action at the, at the General Post Office on tax night to, to shut down the, the um, post office, and that was a famous silence equal death campaign. Mm -hmm. and, and there were signs everywhere saying that, silence equals death. And it was pushing people to speak out and to act. Um, they, they had a takeover and a shutdown of the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Again, <coughs> drugs, care, the chant was, hey, hey, FDA, how many people have you killed today? They had a famous action at St. Patrick's Cathedral because Cardinal O'Connor was so reactionary on this issue and wanted to ban the use of condoms. And still, you know, that's any sex education in New York City public schools. And along with the Catholic Church condemnation of homosexuality. So there was really a confrontation within the church. And they shut down the church. Very important. Then, finally, St. Vincent's, which was a Catholic center, medical center, was set up as an AIDS hospital 10 years later. Now, in China, it took 10 days, <laughs> 10 days to set up a major hospital. 
to build a major hospital. You're right, to build a major hospital from scratch. Two hospitals. But it took 10 years to have a hospital where people could go for hospice care or for drugs or for treatment of any kind and be treated respectfully. And that took a struggle too. They actually had to take over parts of St. Vincent's and, and demand that the, the, that the religious order that ran it change their attitudes on dealing with, with people with HIV. And they trained them. It took a confrontation. It took a confrontation. Uh, during Operation Desert Storm, the 1991 war against Iraq, they took over CBS Evening News uh, with a message, and they got on national TV. They, they went right into the station. The chant was, AIDS is news. Fight AIDS, not Arabs. That was quite a message. And they did the same thing at the McNeil Lair News Hour. There was a big action in Grand Central Station. I was thinking of that tonight as we were watching the Fuck the Police, NYPD, how do you spell racist, NYPD, just this last week. There was a big action at Grand Central Station, big banners, money for AIDS, not for war. And, and signs saying, one AIDS death every eight minutes. That, that's what the toll was at that time. And all across the country this began. They, this is a movement that began in New York and on the West Coast and then everywhere. Different, very radical demands were raised uh, and, and actions of the Department of Health and Human Services by 91, demands for compassionate and, and, and a comprehensive national policy. It was a big deal when even a celebrity at the Oscars or something would speak out and say, we needed a policy toward AIDS. It was 10 years into the disease. The, the demand for treatment efforts, full-scale national education programs, research, that was the biggest demand. And then as new drugs came on, they were prohibitively expensive. So, unless you're very wealthy, and it wasn't covered on insurance. That was another struggle against the insurance companies. Against the insurance companies that these drugs should be covered. And so there were all kinds of actions and sit-ins and whatnot at the insurance companies. To provide basic coverage. So, all of these things, and, and as I say, I'm sure there are folks here that know more about this, and, and we could think about it with other diseases, but it does take a struggle. It takes a struggle, but we should never say, well, because we can't do what they're doing in China, we can't do anything. No, we've got to be able to make real demands, clear demands, demands on the insurance companies, demands on the media, demands against the government as to why there isn't a policy, whether it's for flu, killing 80,000 people last year. Why shouldn't that have been a national program? First thing I want to say is in the, the ruling class was very slow to push for any real treatment for HIV disease. I, I worked at Cabrini Medical Center, which has since closed, and but we had floors of patients that all had HIV or related problems. And they were there for months at a time. And many, many patients died in the hospital because there was no real treatment for the longest time. It was all based on treating the symptoms, but not actively treating the disease. And that was true, I'm sure, at St. Vincent's as well, which is the other capital hospital in that community that caught a lot of the patient population, and the stigma was terrible. And this, for the most part, most of the staff in these hospitals did not want to deal with the disease at all. And the care the patient got, most patients got, left a lot to be desired. I mean, at Cabrini, we did have a number of um, doctors who were sympathetic, largely men, 
gay men who were doctors who worked in the hospital. But beyond that, the nursing staff was so stigmatizing the patients who came in with HIV. And I'm sure I'm not, I'm giving you an experience based on working in an emergency room where there were nurses who didn't want to touch these patients, didn't want to deal with them. And it's an example, and I'm sure that wasn't the only hospital that was true for, but it was a major, major issue in, the, in New York City, the number of people with HIV disease and those who really, did, they got some care, but nowhere near the kind of care that would have made a qualitative difference for many of these patients. And really it was based on no real start to find an answer or drugs that would work. Today, there are lots of drugs out there that people who are HIV positive can take, and it's giving them a longer life because they can control the situation more today than they could then in the 80s. Between the stigma and the lack of concern of people taking care of patients with HIV disease, it was horrendous for the patients. I mean, there were people, there were some people who cared, but for the most part, it was a very stigmatized disease. And the response from healthcare workers left a great deal to be desired. While uh, Farah was uh, performing a wonderful statistic uh, showing the really, really a class struggle in the world in response to the um, people's health, uh, I wanted to mention two very important points. One of them, I was thinking about Iran. I have to do that because I come from that part. We do have an anti-imperial system, but we don't have a socialist system. And our country responded very friendly to Chinese people. And they said, we are ready to do anything you want. Russia also responded. Putin responded very nicely. China had, as Sarah said, a lot of friends around the world who responded nicely exactly opposite to the reactionary position of the uh, White House, saying that uh, the White House is helping U.S. economy. So how could a person be a monster to say that the White House in the United States is helping our economy in the United States? And whose economy? A big capitalist. And those who want to isolate China they did that to the, such an extent that a lot of people are talking now it was a biological attack against China by Russia, by United States. You see, it's, uh, they even write in about that and things because of this reactionary position. But come back to my situation in Iran, we do have this problem in Iran too. So I agree with Sarah that we can't put our hand on each other and say, no, we can't do anything. We have to mobilize the people. One aspect which helped me during this coronavirus in this ideological struggle inside the working class in Iran was the question of China itself, because as we know, the question of China, is it a capitalist system? Is it not a capitalist system? What happened, or, you know, it, it gives a lot of opportunity to bring the left to the right position about China. That could never happen with this. When I see Sarah talking in such a detail, I was hoping I can get a copy of this speech to take to um, our left friends and comrades who are confused about the situation on China. Because the competition in the final analysis between capitalists and socialists is to show who serves the people. It's not who has more weapon. You need weapon. But really, really, people of the world would look at China, how they fight in coronavirus, mm -hmm. and how United States fight the HIV. So I don't think an opportunity like this happens a lot, so party should seize that opportunity, and at the same time, I hope they uh, can explain to the left 
and show the party position was right. Although China is using capitalists to develop the productive forces, but the party is there and there is socialist section. Without that socialist section and the leadership, you won't be able to do that. I was thinking about um, when she told when the comments told me how the nurses didn't want to touch the AIDS patients and all that kind of stuff. That just that's because in the capitalist system we have taught the policy of individualism. So and right over here in America is about everybody's taught to do their own thing and to reject the next person and to reject collective visit and to reject joining together. While in the socialist system they support collective business. That's why in China they able to step to that situation that which is in Wuhan correctly and you see within 10 days they had erected two hospitals, they had other demonstrations going on and they had they had um, put forth the policy, policy by which to combat the um, disease which is spreading over there. While over here in America, they couldn't do nothing like that because the decisiveness and indecisiveness and the disunity of the capitalist system is so widespread. So over here in America, we don't never really, and not just in America, but anywhere in the, in the world where capitalism is the dominant system, you have the spirit of individuality prevailing. Walter made about individualism because in any struggle or any crisis, this is what, you know, the capitalists love to, you know, focus in on rather than what's going on with the masses or what's going on below when the masses are in motion like they were during the 1980s, you know, around the AIDS crisis. Um, I just want to say this too before I get into our other point. You know, the AIDS crisis, and I don't think we can say this enough, it really impacted the movement big time, including our own party. We've lost a lot of wonderful comrades to the AIDS crisis. You know, and it's still painful to this day. Just to, you know, um, it just sort of brought those memories back around the wonderful comrades we lost. Um, and early on, in terms of the crisis, but I, I, I do want to get back to the point that Walter made because um, while all these wonderful demonstrations, important demonstrations were going on, um, you know, demanding, you know, uh, making all these demands, you know, for education, you know, for affordable drugs, you know, etc. Again, you know, I, 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 it just reminded me about four individuals that um, the ruling class really focused in on, I mean, it was, it was good because it opened up the whole uh, discussion about the crisis. That's Magic Johnson. Mm -hmm. What happened to Magic Johnson in 91? You know, because it showed, of course, the, the AIDS crisis greatly impacted the gay community, of course. I mean, along with Haitians and so forth. But when it happened to someone famous like Magic Johnson, it's like, gee, you know, maybe we should know more about what's going on with this, with this um, virus because of who he was. Um, Rock Hudson, who died in 85. That sort of really opened up, I think, you know, in terms of the, you know, the, the whole issue of, um, you know, the impact on, the, on, on, the, uh, on gay men in this country. Ryan White, right. you know, the young man who died in 1990 from a, I think it was a blood transfusion. Arthur Ashe, the incredible tennis player. So anyway, it's just, it's, it just really showed how the AIDS, uh, HIV, AIDS crisis, it just, it just transcended. It transcended, you know, different sectors of our class. Um, but it was really, again, it was the, the, the mass movement, ACT UP, and other uh, organizations that really, really um, um, made the biggest difference, that made the biggest difference in this crisis. Um, because it was happening from below. It was happening from the masses. And um, 
So anyway, it's just, again, the issue of education is so important. And that's what this, this movement really emphasized, the need for education. Um, and to show that, you know, this is not a div divide and conquer thing. You know, this, you know, we're all in this, you know, together. We need to show solidarity with each other. That's, you need that solidarity. And that's what's going on in China today, too, that solidarity with those who are the most impacted and putting those uh, funds and putting those resources towards trying to, to deal with this crisis. So anyway, it's, it's, um, it's really good that we're sort of revisiting this you know, important period. The thing about the effect of that struggle, which was like, um, it was a burst in the whole movement and we're still chanting, act up. You know, that's, that's like still chant, that's a big chant on the street now that comes from that. Um, but the question of the kind of political demands when there's a crisis like this, a health crisis like this, that the party took up years before ACT UP. Um, Leslie Feinberg actually did a lot of research so that the party was putting out in the newspaper and also in popular on the street and literature that explained the science, mm -hmm. that answered the, um, all of the anti, all the anti, um, think of the word for it, but that, that answered it and came up with the demands of a, I forgot the words of it, but that what was needed was what they're doing in China now, and all out, get all, get it, um, I forgot what the name of the project was, kind of, the way they did the atom bomb, where they got, I think that's what it is. Exactly. What, the Manhattan Project. You know, I mean, not the, that's, but the kind of thing where you bring all the top scientists together, you bring all the research together, and you fight this, and that's what we had, our bat, we didn't say banners for the Manhattan Project, but that was raised that was the example. But we did have the banners that not only co they called for money for AIDS, not for war, um, in the pride marches and in other demonstrations, um, but put out that, that that's what was, that's, so to see that's what we were demanding and that's, that's what China is doing. Just wanted to People have talked about international solidarity and how other countries have supported China. And also, particularly during the AIDS crisis, of how difficult it was to get the drugs and how expensive they were. Um, people may know that Cuba, despite all the deprivations and the blockade, has one of the most vibrant biotechnical mm -hmm. industries. And they have developed many medicines, uh, antivirals, etc. One of the most powerful that's in the world today is developed, was developed by Cuba. And it's being used in China to treat this coronavirus. And Cuba has offered the technology um, to, the, to the Chinese government. And a joint uh, China-Cuba team has uh, converted a um, biochemical warehouse or laboratory into a laboratory to mass produce this particular antiviral, uh, which I think the World Health Organization says is one, is one of the best in treating these respiratory viruses. And on January 25th, that's how quickly they were able to get it operating. January 25th was, a, what, I don't know, two weeks after the, they discovered this virus, Cuba has helping China, the Cuban and Chinese scientists are mass producing this viral, this antiviral, which is being distributed, no cost. I mean, the Chinese government is paying for the research and the development and the production. Um, the, the Cubans are not <laughs> taking any, you know, anything from it. Um, in addition, uh, Cubans have sent a medical team to China. Uh, and they, they've set up a command center um, at the Cuban embassy. And one of the things they're doing is they're following every Cuban national that's in China. 
they have the name and are in contact with everyone. None of them have been infected so far, but they're following, you know, each one. There's, there are students studying there. There are uh, uh, diplomats and workers, scientists, and other medical professionals. And Cuba has been able to follow everyone. And that, that, that's part of their health system in Cuba is that they know where everybody is and what their condition is. They have the doctors visit everybody. Um, and, you know, it's part of, the, part of the reason to support a quarantine when there's an epidemic like this is that it enables the government and the medical teams to follow everybody, to know where everybody is and know, know the condition of everybody. Um, and the Cubans are also offering, you know, their medical support. They're, they may be sending more doctors, uh, you know, into China, you know, if they can. Of course, you would never read any about this, anything about this in the U.S. media. In fact, in the U.S. media, all the articles about Cuban doctors lately have been that they're, that the Cubans are trafficking in doctors, they're calling them slaves, they're not being paid enough, they have uh, party officials standing over their shoulders so they can't defect. I mean, just nonsense. When, when you tell the Cubans that, they laugh. You know, most of the Cuban doctors overseas are volunteers. You know, they're not being forced to do to, to it. Uh, and finally, in international solidarity, the Cuban government and the party has put out a statement in support of their, what they call the China, their Chinese brothers and sisters, offering support, offering concern, and, and whatever they can do, and saying, we support you, we're concerned about it. And uh, despite... What, what other people are saying, criticizing you, you know, we have confidence in your ability to, to deal with the situation. And that's, that's what true international solidarity is. In addition to what Bill just said, um, I've read for, of at least two other treatments that's been used. I think Russia provided uh, a vaccine. And China has developed one in the university there. I don't know what's more effective, but the Chinese one is just two days old. I think it was yesterday that this happened. I haven't read anything else about it. So there's at least three treatments right now um, that, I'm, that, that I'm aware of. I didn't know about the, 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 that Cuba's antiviral was being used in China. So that's three at least. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm worried, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this doesn't come true, but this is what I'm thinking. You know, with the indiscipline of the, um, the imperialists and their, their, their grabbing any propaganda um, material they can, um, they, they, they broke Chinese quarantine to remove their populations from Wuhan. And they had no plan to, with, with what to do with these people they were moving because there's no, there's no, there's no, um, no regime for dealing with crises like this in, in the West. So Germany, the United States, and Japan, I think, removed their nationals and, and broke Chinese quarantine to do it. So. I'm, wonder, I'm worried that, you know, with China's approach, they'll probably get a handle on this disease. But I don't think this thing is going to stop spreading around the world in these other countries who aren't taking care of shit, you know. So that's my worry. I hope, I'm, I hope it doesn't happen. Um, I hope it doesn't spread very far, but because the numbers are still small outside of China. But, you know, small can, be, can get big real fast with a virus. Sorry. The U.S. has done two things, along with their racist coverage and all their attacks. Uh, and their worry about what this will do for the stock market and oil prices and all kinds. I mean, the, it's really horrendous, the news articles that you see. They're so self-serving how they're going to make money or lose money on this. Um, but they have barred anyone from China who's Chinese coming into the U.S. They did bring back 5,000 U.S. nationals to the U.S. and asked them to self-quarantine. <laughs> uh, they, they quarantined a, a handful who were running fevers. Uh, and the reason they said they couldn't quarantine the 5,000 people they brought back and were just making it a matter of trust that they would self-quarantine was they said, why to quarantine 5,000 people with just, this was a head of Homeland Security speaking. I mean, they got a lot of resources in Homeland Security, right? So to quarantine 5,000 people would just blow the doors off the budget. So, you know, 35 million people 
we're going to stop a disease, but, but 5,000 people, that would just blow the doors off. See, so these are real, real questions, real questions. Um, because it does show that science cooperating and collaborating, that's the other thing. And that is that the pharmaceutical companies in this country want to own a drug, and they don't want it commonly shared. And they don't want the sequencing, even of a disease, known by everyone. That, that frustrated them that China immediately made this known worldwide within the first two days of the, and, and encouraged everyone to start doing research on it. So, in every crisis, and this is true whether it's a medical crisis, whether it is a tornado, a flood, a fire, uh, whether it's Trump, whether it's a war, every crisis, the response has got to be to not get demoralized, but to think, what are the demands? What is it that people need right now? What is it that the government should provide and is not? And also, how do you concretely build solidarity? How do you break down fear? And those are some of the lessons that the whole world is learning in this example in China, because they're showing medically how they're fighting it, they're showing economically how they're fighting it, but they're also, all of the coverage is a solidarity of people coming to help. And that is such a lesson. So I really, I'm going to encourage you to look at some of the Chinese news services. Let me end on that point because I think we want to study this. We're scientists here. Marxists are scientists. And we got to always be studying world movements, new developments, what the class struggle on the other side of the world is teaching here. And they're also looking to what demands we make here.